All right. Craig, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, welcome everybody. How are you? Uh, welcome to our Social Security and Retirement Income presentation. My name is Craig Ferentino, uh, President and Founder of Craig James Financial Services. We're a um, investment advisory firm and a few other things based in Millville, New York off of Route 110. So I just want to let you know there that uh, I'm just, I don't work with Social Security and I, I do work with everybody who has Social Security but I don't work for the Social Security Administration. So we're giving you this as a way of getting information out as part of our pro bono efforts uh, for the community. And libraries are a great, pretty, great place and Susan's been so nice to host us. So I just want to get started. Uh, everybody here on this call, I assume, unless you're a couple of the carve outs, will be going and applying for Social Security at some point. So it's a very, very important topic. Um, I'm doing this in a way uh, that's going to make it simple and that you could teach it to your kids or your spouse or whatever, uh, mom or dad, you know, whatever you'd like to do, but this is going to work out. If you have any questions, there is a question slot. You just go right into the chat box. You can also raise your hand also, but I think it's easier because every so often I'll check the uh, chat box. Um, I like I don't mind questions if it gets too detailed. Obviously, I can't do too much with it, but uh, we do have a question. Uh, Susan, if I just keep going, just let me know to stop and say we have a question. All right, very good. All right, let's get started. Yeah, not in, not employed by Social Security Administration. Okay, Hypothetical examples, you all this me. good stuff. Go ahead. Yeah. Greg, I'm sorry. I think I accidentally muted you. How's that? Am I okay now? Now you're okay. All right. No more muting. Welcome, everybody. All right. So you can read our disclosure slide. Let's get started. All right. Today, we want to talk about some Social Security basics. Uh, we'll look at consideration for couples, for single people, for divorced individuals. And, um, and then the last thing is just, it gets a little detailed, but we're going to try and coordinate that with some other detailed streams and see what that's about. And because uh, it's not your only source of income, Social Security was never intended to be the sole source of income uh, for people. Now, I'm, in, I'm on the South Fork of Long Island. And uh, as we start to go, as, as the sun starts to fade, if I get really, really dark, let me know and I'll turn on an overhead light. All right. You know, right now, the market for safety has changed. And as we begin, it's important to consider current interest rate environment that we're in, you know, uh, the chart is really based on uh, interest rates. We've actually had negative interest rates. Germany and other parts of the world have had negative interest rates. Now we're starting to see interest rates uh, grow. And um, it used to be that you could expect over 4% yield on top of inflation, on top of inflation. Uh, currently, the uh, according to the government, inflation, yesterday the numbers came in, 3.3%. It was, was a little down from 3.6%. I was on the radio this morning. I'm on a radio every day um, for 10 minutes on uh, 103.9 LI News Radio. And I was explaining to the audience that uh, $100 a year ago now costs you $103.40. And that was down. The government had predicted, or the, the street, the market had predicted, uh, $103.70, and it's $103.40. And that was, you know, the markets rallied, you know, hysterically. Uh, important to note that that is, uh, it's still $103.40 more than last year. It's not much to celebrate, but it is. So the dollar is uh, getting us less. And uh, it's important to note that uh, Social Security uh, does have a component within it that does increase the cost of living adjustment, the COLA, and we'll go through that in a minute. But uh, Social Security is very valuable right now because other safe options simply don't offer the return that they used to. We're not getting, if inflation's at 5%, and we can get 5% in a one-year CD, well, then at the end of the year, discounted from inflation, 
you're, you made 100,000 plus 5%, 5,000, but inflation's at five. So you're not getting anything above inflation. So it's important to note that. Everybody's happy that there's higher interest rates, but we need to get above inflation. So that so the first introduction to Social Security is that it's one of the few things. Most pensions, if you're a teacher or police officer, fireman, they're not they don't have the pensions adjusted for the uh, cost of living. You retire with a pension, and that's the number you get for the rest of your life. And uh, Social Security is a little different. In 2016, we had very low inflation, so the the increase was 0.0 percent, as you can see. Um, January 2020, inflation was still low, 1.6. So now you can see what happens here. Uh, so far, uh, January 2022, 5.9%. January 23, 8.7%. And that's with the adjustment with Social Security. This is what the government said, you're going to get more in your paycheck. So I'll give you an example. If you were getting $2,000 a month in uh, 2021, you're going to add 6% to that $2,000. So six times two is 12. So you'd get another $120 uh, in addition to the 2,000 due to the cost of living adjustment. So if you waited for another year and you were still hopefully alive, in 2023, on top of that 2,120, now you got an 8.7% adjustment. And uh, so that was a big move on top of that. So 8%, 8 almost 9% on... Um, um, that amount would be like another $160. So there you go. You're, you're on the roll. And it compounds. So it's always on the last number that you had. So that's called the COLA, or cost of living adjustment. Very important concept. It's one of the few things in this world that is adjusted for inflation. Since we are on a library presentation, and I know Susan, I'm sure, has it in, in the Harvard Fields Library, there are two great books. There was one written in the 70s, and the title is about the same. It's called The High Cost of Good Intentions. The High Cost of Good Intentions. Then there was one written in the 2000s. And both books are excellent. One talks about New York City, and <clears throat> the second one talks about uh, the whole country and how we gave money and how the this, this social net was initially for war veterans and how it keeps expanding out. And um, once you give, once you have a benefit, it's hard to take it away. Um, and it talks about the whole social security. Uh, what's that about? Now, the other question we get, the number one question we get on social security, well, will social security be there? So is social security safe? That's the number one concern. The graph uh, represents the social security trust fund. The chart is from 2002 Social Security Trustees Report. That's that four-page report with the green line on it, and it's got a little letter from the trustee or the head of Social Security on the front. And uh, there are three separate lines are for the Health Insurance Trust Fund, which is what we call Medicare. The Health Insurance Trust Fund equals Medicare. The OASI Trust Fund, which is the Old Age and Survivor. Imagine those words, Old Age and Survivor Insurance or your quote unquote retirement benefits. And uh, and then the DI trust fund, which is disability insurance or disability benefits. So OASI, HI, DI. That DI is your disability that's in green, OASI. So around, so around 2032, as you could see, which is right here on the bottom of the chart, it, it's claiming that they will not be able to support the current. It doesn't mean it goes to zero, but they won't be able to support, unless something is done, it says, they will not be able to uh, uh, support the, the dollars coming in uh, will not equal the dollars going out. So it's going to cover about 77 cents on the dollar. And that's from the trustees report. So Social Security will be there, but it may be there reduced unless something else is done. What's on the table that could be done, Craig? Well, that's a good question. So what's on the table that could be done is you could change the age. Some people think that 62 is a little young to take Social Security now, based on people are living longer. I don't know if there's a lot of facts behind it, but that's how people feel. Uh, some people say that you can make Social Security needs-based. So, oh, you have a pension for as a teacher and your, your spouse is working. 
you don't need social security. Want, oh, no, they won't use that as an example because that's a middle class example. Here's the example that you'll hear uh, from Washington and that uh, Warren Buffett doesn't need social security. Bill Gates doesn't need social security. Jeff Bezos doesn't need social security. So therefore we're gonna make it needs-based and uh, they'll have some sort of threshold. And then uh, it could be 500,000 in income and you can't get it, but they'll whittle that down to 300, 200, depending. And that'll make social security last a lot longer. Now, does Warren Buffett need social security? No, but these are very few people in our society. All right, so uh, we kind of talked about this and when we think the trust fund will be exhausted. Um, and the, the consensus is here, the CBO, which is uh, probably a very accurate one, is 2032 unless something is done. And that's when the Social Security report is coming in. The soonest estimation of depleted is 2029. That's the Bipartisan Policy Center. And uh, as you can see here, those are in the charts in the middle post-pandemic. Hope I answered the question, will Social Security still be there? Clear as mud. But uh, you, you can see there's some forces working there to do some changes. The problem is if you have a politician, either party, independent, Kennedy, I don't care, we can talk about anybody, either party, it's it's sort of a, a death nail to someone. So uh, they're not going to talk about it. You could read this slide. That's directly from the report. All right. This is a little too into the weeds, so we're just going to take a look. If FICA taxes were increased now, a 3.44% increase would be required. FICA is the amount that's taken out of your paycheck for Social Security. Currently, it's 6.2%. So just let you know in case you don't know what that is. Uh, and if we're increased at depletion, four point, if you wait, they're telling you here that uh, you're going to need a 4 per, 4% increase at the moment you run out. And, you know, a lot of legislation, if you look at the legislation that we have now that we're operating under, uh, it's usually when something panics is when, is when things get done by Congress. It's never like a slow out, oh, yeah, we got to prevent this in three years in the future. It's all uh, something immediate. Right, so we talked about this, that's great. It's amazing how earnings cap, uh, they can increase the earnings cap. Right now, they don't take out your FICA if your salary is more than 168,600. Uh, that number keeps going up. So um, it was 120,000 10 years ago, now it's 168,000. So the next dollar that you make after 168,600 is no longer subject to FICA tax. So for some people, that could be in the month of December. For some people, they never get there. So, uh, but it is important to note that. So oh, back to it, I said the payroll tax. Let me just go back a slide real quick. 12.4, that's you divide that two by two, that's 6.2. Currently, your employer pays 6.2% into Social Security, and you pay 6.2 unless you're self-employed and then you're paying 12.4. All right, let's move on. The social security in this slide is, it's basically saying that this slide, that the social security benefits are increased annually based on the increases in the consumer price index uh, for urban consumers, meaning city consumers. This uh, slide shows the impact of the chained, meaning it's locked into this consumer price index since its inception. So um, that's, and so the Social Security provides an excellent hedge against rising prices, uh, and particularly in a rising price environment. And that was due to something I explained right off the bat, the COLA. All right. So setting aside by what changes may happen in the future, talking about the you know qualifying for Social Security or changing the age or changing the FICA limits, um, let's take a quick look at the different claiming options for those born between 1943 and 1954. So 
I want to just be able to explain this, and this is going to be the crux of our presentation. I could do it better than the slides, perhaps. So you can look at an empty, I could show you a couple, we'll add a couple of things to the slides, right? So taking the, uh, the first sleeve we want to look at is which benefit are we applying for, right? So Social Security has three benefits. So the first column is your work benefit. I'll, without using the technical term, your work, you work, you might've been working since 14 years old. Anything that you had on W-2 might've been captured by social security through FICA. And uh, now you're at a point where you're taking the fruits of all your work because they took money out of your paycheck. It went into this cloud, went into a cloud and the cloud's going to rain on you. How does the cloud rain on you? Well, here's what you have the three sleeves. There's the pre-retirement work benefit. There's the retirement work benefit. And there's the post-retirement work benefit. So your claiming ages are 62 on your work benefit, 62, 66, now 67 because most people born after 1959, I think it is, 1960, will have will be a slide on it, don't worry. And then post-retirement benefit is any time after full retirement. So that's 66 and 70. If you wait till 70s, you could see the, the claiming at age 62 represents a 25% reduction or a monthly benefit of 1,125 rather than Fifteen, the 1500 that you would get. At 66, you would get $1,500. And delaying to age 70 represents a 32% increase or 8% each year for the four years, um, which is uh, incredible. So every year that you wait, if you're still working at 66, you want to keep working until 70, we tell our clients it may be a good thing, you know, unless there's other harrowing factors involved like they're dealing with cancer. But if you look at it, you're getting a 76% increase going from age 62 to age 70. So again, the three sleeves, 62, full retirement age, which I think most people on this call will be 67, and the post-retirement up to age 70. If I wait, Craig, what, if I wait till 71 or 72, would I get those monies? And the answer is, they're not going to give you an increase. <laughs> so you're, you're, the most you're going to get is your age is 70 amount. Please take your social security. All right. This chart is telling us here, if you're born after 1960, the full retirement ages are increased to age 67. Um, and so notice how at age 62, the benefit is reduced by not 25%, but 30% from the full retirement age amount. And rather than someone born prior to 1954, by the way, who's old enough to have taken Social Security by now, um, and this benefit uh, is received at age 67. And age 70, uh, the benefit you, the individual will receive $1,860. You should be able to see from the last two charts how increasing the full retirement age acts as a benefit cut. It's important to notice that the relationship between claiming early and uh, delaying is basically the same. Remember before it was 76% here, it's 77%. So this is a 77% increase for delaying between age 62 and 70. All right. So what if benefits are cut? I, you know, this is a long detailed slide here, and I'm going to skip that for this presentation, but it does look ugly. Let's look at the social security statement. If you didn't do so already, it's important. Now they used to mail you one every year. They mail you one every five years. You wanna to go to ssa.gov. Each year, an estimate of your benefits is prepared for you by social security. So go to my social security, you go to ssa.gov and you go my benefits, create an account, log in, and then guess what? If you wanted to, you could do something different, but I would log in and then uh, give them your information. They, it's, a, it's impressive what they know about you uh, as you give your social and things like that. And then on top of that, 
you want to make sure that uh, you don't give them your phone number. I don't think the government needs your personal cell phone. It says optional anyway, so I tell clients not to do that. The um, When you evaluate your statement, it's really important to understand the assumptions it makes. And uh, some of the assumptions in your statement is, may not hold. So uh, you just want to, you do want to print it because that's your, that's, that's the first place that you would start. The social security statement you receive is assuming you worked until the date that the statement was printed. So if you keep working, your, your benefits can be a little better. So uh, it's important. And your the benefits, you know, it's the, the benefits are for your record only. It does not include spousal divorce, or any other pres uh, different types of claiming strategies that we'll be talking about in the future. There you go. All right, so we talked about the, the claiming years, that's your sleeves. So again, your work record. The other two is your spouse's work record. And your third sleeve is a disability. Uh, or a survivor, someone who's your, 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 your spouse passed. Then the three claiming ages are 62, 67, and 70. So if you understand those three sleeves and these three sleeves, it's going to be very easy to discuss. All right. A good Social Security strategy kind of makes the best out of all three sleeves. So early, full retirement, post-retirement, age 70, we went through that. Early, full retirement, post-retirement. Those are your three sleeves. Here we go. Proposed age for Social Security. In general, the later you were born, the older your full retirement age would be. That's a funny slide that we put in here. Early, receive benefits earlier. People talk about that. They want my advice on when they should take Social Security. Cons or it's the smallest monthly check. So there you go. And if you are still working, you may get a reduction in the amount of Social Security you actually keep. So at age 62, if you're still working, it becomes very inefficient to claim Social Security. Important to know that. So I want to make sure everybody understands that. It's not your, your if you have a good accountant, then I tell you don't do that. And there's for a lot of reasons because you're only going to keep out of the three dollars you're only going to keep one dollar out of the three dollars you make full retirement age higher monthly check no penalty if employed if you go to full retirement age at 67 for most of you then you can keep working and they're not going to penalize you for taking social security at 67. now the uh the downside is that you miss those smaller payments from ages 62 to 67. There you go. So let's take another look here. So 22,000 full retirement age. There you go. Here's how your working impacts your Social Security benefits. At full retirement age, uh, if you take it up to full retirement age, uh, for every $2 over the limit, over a limit of 22,000, 320 is a very small limit, uh, $1 is withheld from your benefits. So for every $3 over the limit of $59,520, $1 with help from your benefits up until age, full retirement age. After full retirement age, that means 67, the day after age 67, when you take, if you take your Social Security to 70, there's no, no, there is no, uh, no, no tax whatsoever. No, no, no penalty or reduction in your salary. There's no reduction in benefits if you continue to work after your full retirement age. If you do not have benefits withheld, your benefit of full retirement age will be adjusted to compensate for your reduction. So if I take it early and I get more payments and I'm not working, those are all three things there, right? And, and or if I wait later, when is the catch up date? And so for single people, it may make sense. Uh, your break even uh, is somewhere in the early 80s. So if I live past, let's say 82, that's where that that's where these charts uh, start. If I wait till 70, that's the blue line. I, I missed those first years. But uh, so I was way ahead with the red, red line, which was the earliest possible time at age 62. If 
But if I'm going to go to 82, 83, by waiting till 70, you will be much, much more ahead. So then the question is, ladies and gentlemen, when do you plan on dying? Now, if you don't have an answer to that, that's a rhetorical question. So if you don't have an answer to that, I understand. But uh, it's if you're going to go, if you think you may go past 82, meaning uh, how are your parents still around? What age did they pass? Did they die of a condition? Or are they, uh, is there longevity genetic in your family? So uh, I think that, uh, so that's, the, that's some of the things that we use in, in the office when people come in and it's part of our equation. Um, yeah. Let's go on to the next one. Considerations for married couples. Let's talk about that for a second. Planning for survivor is critical. You know, um, let's talk about the survivor planning for the survivor and the spouse. And the most common mistake that I see is this. A husband who's the higher wage earner, I'm not saying that's always the case, but in some instances is the higher wage earner and a few years older than the, than the wife uh, claims benefits early because he is not sure how long he will live. If he claims at 62, he will have reduced his wife's survivor benefit meaning that the benefit that she gets in that other sleeve, not in her work benefit, but in her survivor benefit, um, very important, uh, a survivor benefit, she'll reduce the amount, his, his wife's survivor benefit by almost 18% relative to waiting to 66 and 44% relative to waiting 70, you know, age 70. So 98% of survivor benefits currently are paid to women and 80% of women survive their husbands on an average for 14 years. So they'll, they'll actually live longer, 14 years longer than their spouse. Um, this is a long time to have to live on a dramatically reduced benefit. And I try and bring this up as a topic for couples when they're in the office. I'm telling you some of the secrets today as to what we tell people, but that sadly is a fact. And if the woman's going to, if the female's going to live another 14 years past their, their, their spouse's passing, then they're going to have a sub, if, he, if the spouse take, if the husband takes it at a much earlier age, you reduce the benefits by 44% uh, to the wife. All right. There you go. It's, I had it on slides. Here I am. I'm giving the good stuff away. So, are there any questions? You're muted. I assume not. You can just give me a thumbs down and say Q and keep going. Oh, there's no. I'm sorry. There's um nothing in the chat. Good. People are able to unmute themselves. So if they have. Does anybody have a question now? No. Okay. I will stop again. So if you have a question and uh, you just, you know, for the intuitives that need a second to think, you know, we're good that way. So just let me know. So here's the thing. So we'll tell people, sometimes they come in the office, they're dating, maybe, maybe they, um, you know, whatever their family situation is, uh, they don't have a spouse. And you want to take a look at, so I, I, sometimes I'll say, I'm not a matchmaker, I'm a finance person. But, you know, it, might, it may be better if you were married. And so, okay. Um, so the rules are, believe it or not, um, to qualify for spousal benefits, you just need to be married for at least one year, uh, which is quite interesting. So if, if you're, Someone's newly wed and they, they got married and someone passes, the, the spouse could uh, file for one year. The primary worker must have filed for Social Security. Um, so the system is built to avoid penalizing a stay-at-home spouse. That's where this comes from. So the spouse is entitled to the higher of the benefit on their own earnings record, meaning what they made, or 50% of the benefit 
on the higher earnings record. So if, if the if the husband or wife made more than you and they die, you can you're you're going to get fifty percent of their earnings record or yours, whichever is higher. So Social Security is also gender neutral, which means that although this benefit was originally intended for wives, uh, in fact, it was called <laughs> the wives benefit. It can be used by either spouse and could be same gender as well. There you go. If John's uh, benefit would be at full retirement at 67 would be 2000, the spouse would be eligible for half of her full retirement, uh, a, a half at her full retirement age of 1000. And if that's higher than her benefit because she didn't work, then she, she gets that benefit. So filing for spousal benefits, there's some substantial difference between spousal benefits. I'm going to come off camera so I don't distract anybody here. Let me see where's my camera. All right, did I come off camera? No, I'm still on camera. All right, so much for that. There's some substantial differences between spousal benefits and benefits on your own record. Spousal benefits are reduced on a faster schedule then benefits on your own earnings record if you elect early. For example, if your retirement age is 66 and you claim at age 63, you will receive only 75% of your full benefit of what you would receive at 66. And if you take a spousal benefit at age 62, instead of waiting for your full retirement age, you will only receive 70% of the full benefit. And um, so every year past retirement age though, it will be 8% increase. That does not happen with a spousal benefit. So we tell the spouses, please take it at your full retirement age. All right, uh, planning at age 85, Jane planning to dying at 90. Here's uh, two different life expectancies. So when we put the computer, we have this computer program that kind of works uh, uh, very well. We take the work record of both spouses and husband and wife in this case, and the, the difference for John at life expectancy. So if he files at age 62 and dies when he thinks he's going to die, um, he, at the earliest filer for both of them, they would get $964,000, 104 on the current crediting rate. If they wait till 70, uh, and they die at 85 and 90, they're going to get $1,157,040. So that's the difference, you know, using the current cost of living and everything else factored in. It, waiting definitely gives them more money. So we want to take a look at that. All right, uh, 69, okay. So what are the suggested claiming ages? John files at 70, receiving 3,100 per month. And Jane delays to age 69 for a benefit of 2,088 per month. Let's take a look at this. Now we have a break-even chart, which we talked about earliest and as soon as you could do. Based on both of your work records, we actually print that chart there. So we'll get an idea of the red means the earliest, the blue means suggested. So any of the strategies in blue could work for the both of you. So what if you need cash flow sooner? Well, you know, uh, maybe you have some liquidity challenges and are concerned about health of one member, you know, well, if you need cash flow sooner, it often makes sense to do what you might call a split strategy in which one claims early and one claims late. So a lot of times we'll have the wife claim early. So she gets some money coming in. It adds to the cash flow on a monthly basis while the husband's waiting till age 70. And that usually works out. But at least it gets cash flow started in the household sooner. All right. And when you do the split strategy, here's some of those. Here's what that looks like in terms of break, break even and longevity and things like that. Considerations for widows and widowers. These are some unique people in our society, the widow, 60 years old. So one of the survivor benefits, there's your, your benefit 
There's a spousal benefit, which we just covered. Now the third sleeve going this way is your survivor benefit. Benefit. So this is in order to qualify for widow or widower benefits, you must be a widow or widower, of course, and at least 60 years old. You don't have to wait till 62 if you notice that. I want to make that as an emphasis. It's the only opportunity, it's the only time when you could take a social security income at an earlier age, and that's 60. So you can't be married at the time. If you're married, then you lose that spousal benefit, the widower benefit, survivor benefit, unless you remarried after the age of 60. I'll say that again. If you're remarried at 57 and you're trying to claim a spousal benefit on your first husband, I think of some of the people you know that I knew, I don't really know them, but I saw them on TV when I was a kid, like Zsa Zsa Gabor or uh, uh, Elizabeth, um, the famous actress, uh, married to Richard Burton, somebody let me remind me, Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, then you could take a look at those people at multiple marriages. It was, it was a comedy joke at the time. And uh, so they could only claim if they weren't married at age 60, uh, a survivor benefit. But if you're married twice before age 60, you could actually choose which spouse to take a benefit from, which is kind of funny as well. But that's a, that's a topic for another time and another day. So uh, if you remarry after the age of 60, you could you have to be married at least nine months prior to your spouse passing. So one year, it, it says you're married, but to get the survivor benefit, you only have to be married nine months. I know it's a little confusing. For your spousal benefit, you have to be married one year. For as a survivor benefit, you only have to be married nine months. This is what Congress does late at night as this makes the legislation. You tell they were getting tired at some point. So let's look at the widow benefit amounts. Let's do a quick one. If the deceased did not file for benefits prior before they passed, then you'll be either eligible for the full retirement age benefit plus any delayed retirement age benefit, or they could have claimed, or if you claimed them at the date of death, whenever that is. If the deceased filed, you were limited to the higher amount what the deceased was receiving or 82.5% of, of the deceased's full retirement benefit. I'll repeat that again. So if the deceased filed, meaning they were taking Social Security, and let's say they waited till full retirement age at 67, you are limited to the higher of what the deceased was receiving or 82.5% of the deceased's full retirement age benefit. The more, most important thing to know about the widow or the survivor benefit is that you can switch between the widow benefits and the benefits that you burn. So the three sleeves, you can switch between the, not the spousal benefit, but the survivor benefit. You can go to your work benefit uh, based on your work record, whichever works out best for you. Uh, yeah, these are the details. I was trying to explain it without getting into all these numbers here. Bottom point is important. So uh, bottom point is very important. You can switch between the widow or the survivor benefit and your own retirement record. All right. Uh, John never elected and died at age 60. It was, uh, his benefit at age 67 would have been $2,000 a month. Jane is 60 now. Jane's benefit or own earnings at age 62 would be $1,200. Interesting case. So let's take a look at it. What should Jane do? If she files, and there's four things she could do. She could file without thinking. Mm, not a good idea. You could ask the uh, Social Security Administration for help with Social Security when she files for Medicare. So when does she file for Medicare? Usually at age 65, so another five years have passed. So you could follow a strategy based on... Um, uh, from her advisor, whoever that is, and switch to your own retirement. So you could file a strategy by uh, to file a widow benefits at age 60 and then switch to your own benefit. So you take your widow benefit first. Remember, you could switch sleeves and then at age 70, claim your own work benefit. Well, and you'll get the delayed retirement credits at age 70, which is the 8% a year for the four years between 66 and 70. And then follow an alternate strategy, you could also do 
figure it out. We could file for retirement at 62, switch to widow at 66 and eight months, which was her full retirement age. Then she could still work and not get it penalized. File for only for retirement. You're filing, you're saying I'm here at 62 and you can do your first benefit and then switch to your own the widow benefit at 66 years and eight months, which would be her full retirement age. For most of us on the call, that would then be 67 years old. And we've been using the 67 number consistently in our presentation. All right, so what is each choice worth? File without thinking, let's take a look at this. Lifetime value, 514,800. Social Security help with Medicare filing between 65 and 90. So she files right away, which applies still pre-retirement age. And then strategy one, uh, she's waiting till uh, 770. What was strategy one again? Let's take a quick, sorry. Let's take a quick look. Strategy one was file for widow uh, benefit at 60, switched her own retirement, delayed with credits, delayed till 70s. Let's take a look at this again. So strategy one looks very, very good. She ends up pulling uh, $678,480 out of it. And strategy two, which is not going too long, but she's getting a little, uh, little more money at certain times. And uh, she gets $622,000. So depending on the life expectancy age and her employment situation, both strategies that are intentional uh, would net gain significantly more money than doing what most people do, which would be the first two, as you can see there. All right, divorced individuals. So this is your spousal benefit. So to be qualified for spousal benefits as a divorced individual, you'd have to be married 10 years, I'll repeat, 10 years, divorced at least two years and not currently married. So married for at least 10 years, divorced at least two years and not currently married. People ask me, can I file my ex? And that's why you're married now. So you, you lost that option. So in that case, a financial person may say, don't get married, at least until uh, until you're older, you know, until, until then, it's, then we can do a different strategy. The main difference when filing for divorce spouse benefits is if you were divorced less than two years, you'd have to wait until your ex-spouse files for you to receive a benefit. So if the person you were married to doesn't file, you have to wait for that. If you were divorced for more than two years, you're considered independently entitled, meaning you don't care whether the, 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 the ex-spouse is filing or not. You're independently in, entitled, entitled. Uh, meaning you could file whether your ex filed or not. Very important. So your ex does need to be at least 62 years old, though. So even though you're independently entitled, your ex, whether they file or not, and you're, you, you know, you're divorced at least two years, you could still get some money. There you go. There you go. The surviving uh, divorce spouse benefit and amounts are the same uh, available to a widow. If you remarry prior to the age of 60, you will not qualify for the benefit. So please talk to me or somebody uh, if you decide to get married again, you're in that situation. Benefit amount is the same as your surviving spouse. So you're not going to qualify for those other benefits we just talked about. Is there an impact to the ex? That's a good question. We get that. Well, my ex know that I filed on his or her benefits, and the answer is no. Social Security does not uh, does not let them know unless you tell them. Of course, then that's the uh, that's your that's your beef. But uh, no, the Social Security will not know. All right, let's look at retirement income. Really, you know, when you start to take money out. Um, the last piece of the puzzle is fitting Social Security into your overall retirement income strategy. Um, it talks about cash flows coming in on both claim early strategy, and you can see it's pretty level. It's easy, so you can see over here, uh, it's kind of level when you claim early. Uh, it, you'll, 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 if you bring up, you're trying to get to the red lines or you're, you know, you're trying to get to the need, 
Yeah, and Social Security is only supposed to be a, a quarter of what your actual need is, but it is helpful to have that. In the years after 2045, if you filed early, you're getting, you, you're getting much, much, much more green, and that's what you see there because you have more money coming in overall. So here's another case. Um, you see a different pattern of cash flows hitting this household. In this case, there's a gap on the front end, right? And then a much smaller gap during the client's lifetime. Now, this is because they waited, you know, till let's say age 67. So there's a much smaller gap during the person's lifetime. So if for people, we want to make sure that uh, my, my personal feeling is not, not to rely on Social Security if we could delay it, provided that you have longevity, you don't have health issues and a few other things we like to look at. Uh, it's, it, it's good to delay Social Security and then use your IRA assets. Because what happens is, and I'm talking off the slide here, but what happens is, is that in reality, the government's going to make you take a required minimum distribution on your retirement assets. When you take a required minimum distribution on your retirement assets, the current age is 72, going up to age 73. So at age 73, if you're sitting on, I don't know, some number, uh, it's going to be uh, at least five or six percent of that number. So if it's a, if it's it's if it's a million dollars, it's probably you know you multiply six percent. The government's going to make you take out sixty thousand. So I like to tell people that the IRA and your retirement assets could be used in the early years of your retirement uh, to supplement, to take the need of the money that you need until you turn on Social Security. Now, might, in some instances, it's only a couple of years from when they retire, they don't have an income coming in. Sometimes it's just a couple of months. But that's a good strategy because if they decide to work post 67, they won't get penalized, that's one. Number two, they're gonna get a higher amount. And every year they wait, they're getting an 8% federally guaranteed raise. I don't know if I can make 8% over the next four years in the market, and we do a lot of investments. I, I'm certainly doing okay this year, but I can't say that for the next four years. So it's very, very important to uh, to, to utilize that as a strategy. It's, it's kind of changing the way you think a little bit, and I think that would be, that would be really good uh, if you took a thought with that. Um, how is Social Security tax? It's very interesting. We do a taxes and retirement uh, uh, seminar. And I know uh, Susan may queue us up for that one as well. But this is part of that presentation. 50% uh, of your Social Security benefit is considered taxable income. So if you're getting $2,000 a month, it's important to know that $1,000 is going to be considered as part of your taxable income in order to make a threshold. So half of your Social Security benefits is included in the income that they use to calculate if your Social Security is taxable. They also take other income from tax-free bonds, even though they're tax-free, they're included in what's called provisional income. And they take your income from all your CDs and your money markets paying 4% or whatever. And it all comes in there. If it's all in there, it all gets calculated. And I'd like to say that most people on Long Island, uh, haven't run into too many people, find that 85% of their social security benefit is taxable which means that the corollary, and uh, if I was a positive person about this topic, I would say, well, 15% of your Social Security benefit, let's say we have $2,000, well, it's good to know that $300 of that $2,000 will be given to you tax-free. You won't have to pay any taxes, but on the rest of the money, the, the, the $1,700 is gonna be considered ordinary income to you and tax at the highest rate that the government has for it, which is ordinary income, not capital gains rate. Here's how this works. If you're a single filer, if your income, including half of Social Security, is over 34,000, then your benefits will become taxable up to 85%. And if you're married filing jointly, they call this the marriage penalty. It's one of the few places it still sits. You would think you would take 34,000 times two. Can you see that? It would be 68,000, but no, it says 44,000. So if you're married filing jointly and you're making uh, over 44,000, up to 85% of your social security benefit will be considered taxable. If social security uh, was your only income, I would say that your benefits are probably not taxable. Um, you also may not need to file an income tax return. But that's very, very, uh, it's very, very low number there. 
So these tables have been the same since 1985. And um, got to look at taxes. So there you go again. Married, fine, jointly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's getting deep in the weeds. I don't want to lose anybody here. I think we got the good three sleeves of Social Security, your benefit, spousal benefit, and survivor benefit. And the three claiming ages are 62, uh, 67, or later is full retirement age, and age 70. So three three sleeves on how you're going to claim, three three times the claim. So very, very important to have that down. Uh, this is telling you that if I took out money from Social, Social Security and IRA withdrawal, I'd be subject to more taxation. And if I took more out of Social Security and less out of the IRA withdrawal, then I would only be taxed at 22%. All the more important as to why you would delay Social Security and uh, start to use your IRA in those earlier years so you don't have to take out a $50,000 withdrawal. You're only taking out a $20,000 withdrawal because you depleted some of your IRA once age 73 comes around. It's a little bit of advanced planning, but I think it's important to go over. Uh, the restricted applications aren't really applicable anymore, so we're going to scotch that for now. Uh, scotch that. That's the that's the that's the other one. The bipartisan budget act of 2015 uh, eliminated those restricted filing file and suspend they call that. So that's uh, that was believe it or not the uh, famous uh, 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 speaker of the house Paul Ryan was the champion of this. This was a benefit that all of our a lot of our clients who were of that age. Uh, we're taking advantage of, and he uh, did away with it all in one. I was on a conference, and I don't think any. I was with financial advisors; not one of them knew what I was talking about. But you know, having to client file and then claim on your wife, or your, you know, and and then and then turn off your wife's benefit and claim on your own benefit. That was the strategy that we talked about that started under Clinton, and uh, Paul Ryan ended it. And so I don't know how much it saved Social Security, but I didn't see a lot of the numbers work. Certainly helped out a lot of clients at the time. All right. If you filed already in Social Security and you went to my presentation, you said, you know, Craig, this is uh, very interesting. I might have made a mistake here. Uh, or, if, you know, you could, if it's within a year from the date of filing, you could actually rescind your Social Security application. And um, you, uh, so it might be a good idea for some people. You have 12 months from the date of your initial election to use them and you use fo form 521, which is what we have printed here, to say that you made a mistake. Now, they'll figure out what the amount is, but you have to return all the money that they gave you over the first, you know, let's say you filed five months and you realized you made a mistake. So it's important to know that. Um, you know, why not ask the Social Security Administration for advice? It's a good question. There's, you know, the, in, uh, the nearest one, the Harbor Fields, is on uh, Route 110 in Huntington Station. Um, they are actually precluded by their rules. The administration employees are not really allowed to tell you what the best claiming strategy is for you. That's why it's important that we, when we see people, it's important to go over that. You, uh, you know, you may get some very different results. Uh, they can't ask you about outside assets and what are the things you can do. And obviously how how and when you take Social Security is going to impact how you, you use your other assets. So missing this piece doesn't get you where you need to go, which is really you're looking for cash flows in retirement. All right, this is, uh, this is again, this is a general presentation, so I won't go over this at all, but uh, we'll just talk about it. All right. Good. What questions have you got? Thank you very much. If you have any questions about today's presentation, you can certainly ask it now. If there's something afterwards that you want to talk about as on a personal level, you can always call the office and it's been a little busy, but we'll get to you. Sue, anything you have there? My last presentation, there are no questions, which means I'm a oh, very good teacher. It's very, it was very thorough. So maybe there's no questions today either. So, no? No, no, nothing in the chat. Well, I'm going to come off. Please feel free to give Sue some feedback and uh, just let her know what your thoughts are. It doesn't have to be tonight, but uh, please feel free to do what you can to give Sue your feedback and let her know what we could do in the future 
and uh, and let her know if you like the presentation or not. Well, we also have Craig uh, scheduled to come back in September and October for two different oh, seminars as well. So uh, watch out for the September and October newsletters. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> well, thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Amir. Uh, let me see. Oh, something popped up in the chat. And it. Well, I think it was just a thank you. Thank you. Very informative. Okay, that's from, uh, I see that, Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie. Much appreciated. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Stay healthy. Enjoy the sun. All right, bye-bye. Yeah.